test? Test. Check, check, one, two, one, two, one, two. Check one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. All good. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. What a crowd. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the University of Regina's historic College Avenue campus, particularly to those who haven't been here since it's been renovated. I'd like to welcome Tom Chase, the Provost, and Dave Malloy, the Vice President of Research. Great to see you here. My name is Doug Moen, and I'm the Executive Director of the Johnson Shama Graduate School of Public Policy. JSGS is a joint collaboration between the University of Regina and the University of Saskatchewan with the goal of educating graduate students and public servants interested in advancing public se sector values. JSGS offers over six graduate programs, six master's certificates, and a wealth of executive and board education options. I'm pleased to welcome you, our guests here today, both those in the room and those joining us by live stream. I'd like to acknowledge that this presentation is taking place on Treaty 4 territory in the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respects to our First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. We're pleased to welcome the Honorable Ralph Goodale to speak on national security tools and architecture for a changing and difficult world. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to provide a brief overview of today's events. Following introductions, we'll begin with a 30-minute presentation by Minister Goodale, followed by a question and answer period which will be moderated by Dale Eisler, who is a JSGS Policy Fellow. Those interested in asking a question are invited to find their way to the microphone, which will be just placed down here in the center aisle. For those joining by live stream, please submit your questions in the comments box, and we'll ensure that you're, they're given to the moderator. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, the Honorable Ralph Goodale. Ralph Goodale is Canada's Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness, and the Member of Parliament for Regina Wascana. He was raised on a farm near Wilcox, Saskatchewan. He was educated at both the University of Regina, receiving his BA, and the University of Saskatchewan, his law degree. He served for three decades as Member of Parliament and in Cabinet previously as Minister of Agriculture, Minister of Natural Resources, Leader of the Government in the House of Commons, Minister of Public Works, and Minister of Finance. Canada has been very fortunate to have a Minister of Ralph Goodell's knowledge and experience serving in the portfolio of public safety and emergency preparedness. If there ever was a 24-7 department, it's this one. This is a portfolio that carries extraordinary responsibility for the safety of Canadians. The need to address national security threats such as terrorism is key, a key part of this role. A minister with gravitas is obviously essential. Please join me in welcoming Minister Goodell to the stage. Doug, thank you very kindly. And good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, it's always good to be back at the University of Regina. And in this uh, historic and wonderfully refurbished College Avenue building, 
I'm very glad that the, uh, the government of Canada uh, was your partner in getting this facility restored and renewed for generations to come. As we gather on the territory of uh, Treaty Number no. 4 and in the homeland of the Métis, my thanks to Doug Moan and the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School for giving me an opportunity today to discuss some of my principal responsibilities in the federal cabinet. Before the last federal election in the fall of uh, 2015, the notion of becoming Canada's Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness had quite frankly never crossed my mind. As a former Minister of Agriculture, Natural Resources, Public Works and Finance, my focus had always been on economic issues. But the Prime Minister seemed to have this other idea. And uh, ever since then, I have been immersed in a world of spies and espionage and guns and gangs and opioids and transnational crime and migration and refugees, prisoner transfers, segregation, and natural disasters like storms and floods and wildfires. It's both exhausting and exhilarating, something like trying to drink from a fire hose. The issues are tough, and on some days, I have to admit, it's a little bit hard to find the upside in this portfolio. Nevertheless, three years and two months into this job, I can tell you it is a great honor and a great adventure to go to work every day in the public safety portfolio. Firstly, because of the tremendous, courageous, and skilled Canadians that I get to work with every day. Secondly, because of the gravity of the issues that confront us. And thirdly, because those issues are inextricably connected to jobs and growth and prosperity, the economy and the well-being of Canadians. Having a safe and secure country governed by the rule of law and due process is an absolute prerequisite for a thriving economy. Security, provides the stability upon which free markets depend. It provides the predictability and the confidence upon which investors rely. Equally important, as safety and security are achieved and as the law is applied and administered, Canadians must be able to have absolute confidence that their rights and freedoms are fully respected and protected. We are fortunate indeed to live in a free, open, diverse, inclusive democracy, probably the finest example of pluralism the world has ever known, and we need to work hard every day to keep it that way, especially in a world that is complex, always changing, and sometimes dangerous. By way of background, the public safety portfolio has existed since 2003. It includes the department itself, which deals with policy development, research, coordinating issues, program delivery in such diverse fields as emergency planning, countering radicalization, First Nations policing, anti-gang services, a new legal regime for cannabis, battling PTSI among first responders, and much more. But the bulk of the work in this portfolio gets done through a collection of essential independent agencies with extraordinary powers and responsibilities, like the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the Canada Border Services Agency, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, the Correctional Service of Canada, the Parole Board of Canada, to name the major ones. Altogether, this portfolio includes over 60,000 dedicated personnel and an annual budget of more than $10 billion. All to keep Canadians safe, to keep Canada secure, and to safeguard our rights and freedoms and the open, inclusive, democratic way in which we want to live our lives. Today I'd like to touch on four big topics from this portfolio, but I hope that you will find interesting. One is Bill C-59 our new legislation designed to renovate Canada's national security architecture to reflect the realities of this tough and turbulent world. Secondly, 
the issue of high-risk terrorist travelers and how we deal with the threats that they pose. Third, Canada's new cyber security strategy and the steps that are being taken to protect all of us from malicious attacks. And finally, foreign interference in Canadian affairs by state actors, including those who would use malicious influence to drive wedges of confusion, fear, and hate, and to do damage to our democracy. So first of all, Bill C-59, an act respecting national security. It has passed the House of Commons. It's presently in the Senate for final consideration. The product of the most open and comprehensive public consultations about national security ever in Canadian history, the new legislation, once passed, would accomplish three important objectives. To start with, it will make several corrections in the law to fix what we consider to be previous errors, like language that was too vague and rendered some provisions in the law very unlikely ever to be used. A defective no-fly list that victimized children, implied contraventions of the charter, and so forth. These matters are remedied in Bill C-59. Secondly, the bill strengthens and clarifies the constitutional and legal authorities under which our security and intelligence agencies operate. And it creates some new tools for them to use. Various court decisions and expert reports have raised questions about these matters in recent years, and it is vital that there be no doubt about the powers and authorities that these agencies have, how they can be used, and where the fences are. Clarity is essential to effectiveness. Finally, Bill C-59 ushers in a whole new era of transparency and accountability. It creates a new comprehensive national security and intelligence review agency with a government-wide mandate to examine any and all federal departments and agencies with a security or intelligence function. Gone will be fragmented reviews conducted in isolated silos. The new agency will have full authority to follow any issue wherever it goes across the entire government. It, its work and expertise will complement the separate and independent reviews done by our new National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians. We're also creating a new intelligence commissioner with oversight authority to examine and approve or disallow certain proposed security and intelligence activities before the fact. If the commissioner says no to a certain proposed activity, then that activity simply will not take place. CSIS, that is the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, is Canada's human intelligence gathering agency. In C-59, it will gain a clear set of rules for managing and utilizing large-scale data sets upon which CSIS depends for much of its analysis. The rules will be explicitly laid out in the statute. CSE, the Communications Security Establishment, is Canada's Signals Intelligence Gathering Agency. CSIS is Human Intelligence Gathering. CSE is Signals Intelligence Gathering. In C-59, CSE gains its own standalone legislation, which is it never had before, and the authority to undertake active, not just defensive, cyber operations to take down imminent cyber threats to Canada before they can attack us. Other changes improve information sharing among federal government agencies. There are strong rules against behavior that might contribute to torture, and the whole package will be reviewed from top to bottom in five years to make sure that the balance that we've tried to strike now is in fact the correct one. We have two overarching objectives in C-59. To ensure that the rights and freedoms of Canadians are properly respected 
and equally to ensure that our police, security, and intelligence agencies are actually doing everything we expect of them to keep Canadians safe. I'm hopeful that Bill C-59 will win the approval of the Senate soon and become law early this year. Now let me turn to the second major topic for today, and that is how we combat those who have become radicalized to extremist violence and sometimes travel abroad to inflict terror. Since the beginning of the evil rampage of barbarism launched in Syria and Iraq a few years ago by the so-called Islamic State, more properly known as Daesh, close to 40,000 individuals from various countries worldwide have been lured into the terrorist cause and have traveled to various global locations to participate in some way. Mostly that travel occurred before 2016. Canada's share of this problem is small and, but, and basically stable, but we are not immune. Working closely with our international partners, Canada's security, intelligence, and police agencies have identified approximately 250 of these high-risk extremist travelers with a connection to Canada who have journeyed overseas about half into Syria, Iraq, and Turkey, and the rest into Afghanistan, Pakistan, and parts of North and East Africa. Some of them have become actual battlefield combatants. Others have done fundraising or operational planning or online propaganda, recruitment, training, and other complicit activities. Some were just camp followers. There are about 190 of these people still abroad. Some of them, perhaps many, are dead. Others now have spouses and children. There are close to 60 individuals who left Canada and are now back. A small number from that Syria, Iraq, Turkey theater, but most from elsewhere. Again, to repeat, the bulk of that terrorist travel, both out and in, occurred before 2016. The figures have not changed substantially over the past three years. Notably, despite the defeat of Daesh on the battlefield and the retaking of the city of Raqqa some 15 months ago, there has been no recent surge of returnees to Canada. A few of these terrorist travelers with a nexus to Canada are known to be in the custody of the Kurds in Syria, in a volatile and dangerous region with no effective governance where Canada has no diplomatic presence. It should be noted that while every Canadian citizen, no matter how reprehensible, has the legal right to re-enter Canada, the government of Canada has no legal obligation to facilitate their return. CSIS, the RCMP, the Global Affairs Department, and other security, intelligence, and law enforcement agencies work constantly to know as much as we possibly can know about every threat to our national security. That work is carried out 24 seven, both internally across all agencies and in close collaboration with our allies in the coalition against Daesh, NATO, the Five Eyes Security Alliance, the G7, EU, Interpol, various UN agencies, and others. All available data is steadily and expertly assessed and reassessed to ensure that we are up to date and accurate on all risks and threats and the individuals who pose them and ready to deal with them. Canadians who involve themselves in terrorism and violent extremism can expect to be investigated, arrested, charged, and prosecuted to the full extent of the law. That is the government's prime objective and priority. Since specific terrorism offenses first appeared in the criminal code some 15 years ago, over 100 charges have been laid involving 55 individuals, and 27 of them 
have been convicted of one or more offenses so far. Among that small group of returnees, specifically from Syria, Iraq, and Turkey, four have been charged and two convicted so far. But evidence that can be used in a Canadian courtroom is often difficult to get, particularly when it must be derived from a foreign war zone half a world away in a place that is still dysfunctional and dangerous. All our democratic allies face the same essential challenge. While evidence is being collected and assessed, or where charges are difficult to lay, a full suite of other measures are deployed against terror suspects, including surveillance, interrogations and further investigations, intelligence gathering and lawful sharing, ongoing threat assessments, no-fly listings, criminal code listings, the refusal or revocation of passports, terrorism peace bonds, and legally authorized threat reduction measures. It's all about keeping Canadians safe. The specific measures to be used in respect of any particular individual or situation are determined by Canada's police, security, and intelligence agencies. They are professional, not political, and they are highly regarded by international counterparts. One final point, Daesh and Al-Qaeda are not the only sources of dangerous extremist violence. It can come from any type of fanaticism. For example, an increasing concern are groups of right-wing white supremacists and neo-Nazis who foment hate, which manifests itself in violent anti-Semitism, for example, or a brutal misogynistic van attack along Young Street in Toronto, or the murder of six Canadian citizens near Quebec City only because they were at prayer in a mosque. All this, too, is a threat to Canada and Canadians, which demands and gets the attention of our public safety agencies. Now turning to cyber security. Over the past two decades, information technology has totally revolutionized our lives. The world has become smaller and faster and more complex and interrelated. People are more connected to each other than ever before and connected to a vast array of things around them and more dependent on those connections and more vulnerable. The internet and smartphones have become an inextricable part of who we are. We spend a big portion of our waking hours online. In fact, at 43 and a half hours per month, Canadians are the most online people in the world. That's how we work and play and shop and bank and do business and do science and entertain ourselves and stay in the know and keep in touch with family and friends. Digital technologies enrich our lives in countless ways. And underlying them is complex infrastructure upon which our economy and our modern society depend. As part of that, our most sensitive personal and financial information is quite literally floating in a cloud. And millions of times every day, millions of times every day, hackers at home and around the world are trying to break in. The culprits may be foreign states or militaries or spy agencies or terror groups or organized crime or petty thieves or people with corporate or personal grudges, or sometimes it's just the computer wonk next door trying to see how far he or she can get. The hacker's objectives range from theft and extortion to sabotage, intimidation, revenge, disruption, chaos, to simple nuisance. The tools available to them are sophisticated, prolific, and cheap. They look to exploit gaps in the system and weaknesses or bad digital hygiene. And given our ubiquitous interconnectedness, 
we are all only as strong as our weakest link. Imagine the damage that would ensue if a major digital infrastructure system were to be compromised in telecommunications, for example, or banking, or healthcare, or transportation like air traffic control, or energy transmission. And it's not a hypothetical problem. Foreign hackers have twice brought down the electrical power system in Ukraine with widespread consequences, and that is just a small example. Based on the most recent information from Statistics Canada, cyber crime in this country is causing more than $3 billion in economic losses every year. Globally, the losses in 2018 are estimated at more than $600 billion. When asked what keeps him awake at night, the governor of the Bank of Canada not long ago said, the threat of cyber attacks. So this is a large and very real worry. But we cannot allow ourselves to be driven by fear. As we roll out Canada's new cybersecurity strategy, we are equally focused on the opportunity that it creates for the most cutting edge research, scientific discovery, innovation, advanced engineering and manufacturing, new business development, global exports, job creation, prosperity, and growth. Cybersecurity is indeed a growth industry. It already contributes $1.7 billion to our GDP and more than 20,000 excellent jobs. The global market for top quality cybersecurity products and services stands at close to $100 billion today, and that is likely to more than double in less than three years. The global thirst for cyber expertise in all industries across all sectors is simply enormous. Every country is struggling to develop the needed talent and skills. Right now, Canada is probably the world's fourth largest innovation hub for cybersecurity. But we have huge potential to do better and better. With industry and academia, we should reach for the very top. And to do that, we need to leverage all available resources. In that regard, I would note that our last federal budget funded the largest investments in science and innovation ever in Canadian history. Cyber needs to get an important piece of that action. And let me ask the hypothetical question. Is this a field that might become a focus of expertise for Johnson Shoyama? or for others at the University of Regina or the University of Saskatchewan. It is a huge growth sector. The last federal budget also identified $750 million over five years for our new federal cyber plan. A third of that, $250 million, goes to Shared Services Canada to enhance and protect cyber systems within the government of Canada. In my view, the greatest benefit of Shared Services Canada is to ensure coherence and high standards of cybersecurity across all federal IT systems. But it's equally vital to protect private sector systems. So we're investing $155 million to create the new Canadian Center for Cybersecurity. It has become our national operational authority, bringing together all federal cyber expertise under one roof for analysis, advice and services to governments and to the private sector, large and small, including the operators of critical infrastructure. The center also works to enhance public awareness, education, and smart digital hygiene. Incidentally, the head of the new Canadian Center for Cybersecurity is Scott Jones, who comes from Regina. As part of our plan, the RCMP is receiving $200 million to strengthen cyber crime investigative capacity and to stand up a new national cyber crime coordination unit to support, assist, and coordinate law enforcement activity in this field across the country. As well, CSE, the, the uh, Communication Security Establishment, 
CSIS, Public Safety Canada, Global Affairs, Natural Resources, the Innovation Department, the Employment Department also gain new resources, including for a voluntary certification service to verify cyber proficiency in the private sector, and for an integrated work and learning program for a thousand students across the country. And that can only be just the beginning. Another piece of our strategy can be expected in the weeks ahead. Based on extensive consultations, we are aiming to introduce a legislative framework to help ensure we all understand the obligations that we share with each other in a deeply interconnected and interdependent cyber world. What are the most sensitive and vulnerable sectors upon which we all depend? What are the appropriate standards and the best practices that must apply to those critical sectors? What duty does a hacking victim have to report being attacked? Apply remedial measures, notify their customers and clients, and help protect others. Again, the crucial point is the weakest link. It can bring down the whole house of cards and do irreparable harm. Those links need to be avoided to the maximum extent possible. Finally, today, I want to mention foreign interference. From time immemorial, governments worldwide have been engaged in efforts to mold public opinion and government policy in other countries in order to advance their own interests. And as long as that is done in a peaceful, open, transparent manner within the law, it's fine. It's called diplomacy or treaty negotiations. Our Team Canada efforts to provide information, shape opinions, and build support in the United States for NAFTA are a good and proper example. All very public, all based on facts and without any objection. But when that type of activity becomes covert and clandestine, when it's dominated by lies and disinformation, aimed at misleading people, destabilizing the economy, or manipulating democratic processes, a bright red line gets crossed. It could be espionage to steal commercial secrets or sabotage a global competitor. It could be murder to silence a vocal critic or foreign, maybe foreign agents providing illegal funds to support candidates in election campaigns. It could be coercing members of a diaspora or using social media to falsely slander a cabinet minister. It could be funding bots and trolls to stoke anxiety, even hysteria around sensitive issues. And we've seen instances of all of these things. These types of hostile state activities have become a leading topic of discussion and concern among Canadians and between our country and our partners in the Five Eyes and the G7. There is increasing determination to work in concert internationally to uncover illicit behaviors and confront rule-breaking countries. You will have seen some of that in the past with respect to Iran and North Korea and Russia, a country that has floated the rule of law and acceptable norms time and again. As part of a coordinated response to the nerve agent attacks in the United Kingdom last spring, Canada expelled four members of Russia's diplomatic staff. Foreign Minister Freeland said at that time, and I quote, the four have been identified as intelligence officers or individuals who have used their diplomatic status to undermine Canada's security or interfere in our democracy, end of quote. At last summer's G7 summit, which was hosted by Canada in Charlevoix, Quebec, a new G7 rapid response mechanism was announced to help tackle common threats. It will strengthen information sharing on foreign activities that undermine our democracies and identify opportunities for coordinated responses. A very recent example in December was the collective condemnation by several countries, including Canada, of hostile cyber activity that hacked and compromised 
a number of IT service providers around the world. Canada's Communication Security Establishment, CSE, and its counterparts in other democracies concluded that the intrusive activity was almost certainly attributable to the Ministry of State Security in China. And we all said so, collectively, publicly, together. Protecting our democratic institutions and countering hostile state activity are pressing priorities for the Government of Canada, and that includes safeguarding the integrity of this year's federal election. Domestically, Bill C-76 will help. It received royal assent in December. Among other things, this Election Modernization Act will prohibit Canadian third parties from partisan activities using foreign funds, whether during an election campaign or not. It also requires all organizations who sell advertising space to not knowingly accept election ads from foreign entities. Most importantly, Canadians themselves need to become more alert to what foreign intrusions look like and skeptical about fake news masquerading as legitimate information, especially on social media. Furthermore, when our professional security and intelligence agencies become aware of illicit foreign meddling in our democracy, Canadians need to be informed about that. They can make their own judgments about what to do about it, but they at least need to know it is happening. One of the key challenges that is yet to be resolved is this, who blows the whistle? In the heated partisanship of an election campaign, for example, what trusted authority, agency, or group has the credibility, respect, and nonpartisan credentials necessary to publicly identify and call out corrupt activity as originating in a foreign capital for the purpose of perverting the course of democracy in Canada? It's a challenging problem, but one that needs a credible answer as the campaigning gets underway later this year. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been very patient, and I want to thank you for your attention today. Let me close simply by repeating one brief point. In all of our security and intelligence service, services at all levels, and among all of our first responders and emergency personnel of all kinds, Canadians are indeed fortunate to have an amazing team of strong, talented, dedicated people. They are indeed world-class. And every day, they give their best to keep us all safe and to safeguard the precious rights and freedoms that make Canada, Canada. I thank them for their service. And I look forward to your questions. Okay, um, hi everybody. We have about uh, 23 minutes uh, for questions. We have a microphone that's gonna be set up right here for, for questions. Uh, and um, I'd ask you to keep your, your questions as precise as, as we're short on time as, as possible and the answers as well. And also I think uh, people who are following on live stream can be sending in uh, also uh, questions by text that uh, will get passed up here for our, if I could, just before we go to the microphone, sorry. Um, Minister Goodell, you, you set out a, what was really a daunting and complex array of issues. I mean, it's kind of staggering to hear you talk about all these things and how they all intersect and what, and you mentioned the governor of the Bank of Canada, what keeps him awake at night, which is sort of cybersecurity and the financial system, what could happen. Tell us, is there, is there one thing that keeps you awake at night or is it many things, but uh, can, can you reduce it to one? It's all of the above. Uh, well, if you have to use the, the um, I, I think Dale, it's it's uh, 
it's uh, protecting the integrity and the values uh, of, our, of our country. Uh, Canada is in such a fortunate position globally. Uh, the world is, is going through a period of some uh, uh, considerable uh, tumult uh, and turbulence. Um, and certainly we're not immune from that. We're, we're impacted in a number of uh, very direct ways. But uh, compared to most other places in the world, uh, we live in a very fortunate set of circumstances. Uh, and uh, it is just critically important that we, uh, we work in a, in a principled way to, uh, to retain those values. And in the face of all of the threats and risks and pressures, we need to make sure that we're protecting ourselves in the right way. Uh, so yes, we are ensuring our, our safety and our security, uh, but at the same time, we're also uh, safeguarding our rights and freedoms uh, in this uh, free, open, inclusive, democratic country, uh, which is one of the very few in the world that enjoy these kinds of benefits and, uh, uh, and values. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's maintaining both of those in this portfolio, maintaining both of those priorities at the same time, making sure people are safe and that uh, the country is secure and that uh, all the necessary steps are being taken uh, to ensure that is the case, and at the same time, that rights and freedoms and the very privileged way in which we live is not compromised. Okay, good, thank you. We have a question here. Yes, hello, Hi. Minister Goodale. Thank you, I feel very secure with what you're saying. My concern, as you know, are the collateral damage that people suffer. People go under um, situations such as Omar Cotter. I'll use him in the case. He was denied a passport. The guy has gone through hell. Why, why was he treated so badly? And what could be done for collateral damage for future situations like his? Well, the, the, uh, uh, those particular issues have, of course, been, uh, uh, been litigated and uh, a settlement arrived at and, and, and so forth. But your, your, your point, uh, uh, I, I think, is, is similar to the one that I was uh, making in my preliminary answer to, uh, uh, to Dale. And, and that is we need to ensure uh, that we are... are uh, protecting the rights and freedoms of Canadians right alongside of their, their physical uh, safety. Uh, and that's why in the legislation that I've introduced, not just Bill C-59, but several other pieces of, uh, of legislation, there has been a very strong emphasis on transparency, on scrutiny, on public reporting, uh, to make sure uh, that uh, uh, the appropriate rules and principles and values are being followed and, and applied. Um, the, uh, uh, I've, I've found too in, in dealing with the security agencies that, that they have, have welcomed this step uh, that we have taken in, in Bill C-59 and in other pieces of legislation to enhance the, uh, the transparency uh, and the accountability uh, within these institutions. That's why we have this new INSERA, it's called the National Security and Intelligence uh, Review Agency. Some people call it a super CERC. Um, when we were going through the consultation, this was one of the ideas that a number of groups and organizations brought forward, that there should be a comprehensive review agency, not just one review agency for, for each of the security institutions, so they operate in in uh, stovepipes and they never talk to each other, uh, but rather one comprehensive review agency that covers the entire government. And if they've got an issue, they can follow it anywhere it goes. And um, they are entitled to complete disclosure of, uh, of all uh, information and, and, uh, and data and, and information, including classified information. Um, this will be a, a major innovation uh, in our security architecture, uh, and one that the, uh, the agencies have by and large uh, welcomed. 
uh, so that uh, they can have an independent body uh, over which they have no control, uh, but a body that can examine everything that they are doing and report to the public. While they can't reveal classified information, they can report to the public that, that what is going on in the name of national security is in fact being conducted properly. And they want that, that independent verification. And with the new NSIRA in place, when the legislation is finally adopted, we'll have that better, more comprehensive uh, transparency. Thank you. Good. Another question? Dave? Thanks, uh, Dale. The Minister Goodale. Uh, although I, I support the granting <clears throat> of amnesty to the young Saudi Arabian woman in Thailand who was fleeing her family and her, her country, I support Canada granting her uh, asylum. Why on earth was Minister Freeland uh, at the airport draping herself all over her and creating, making a political statement and a political event out of her arrival in Canada? Well, the, uh, the minister was there simply to, uh, uh, to uh, issue a greeting. As I understood it, it was, uh, it was this young woman's choice to come out and, and uh, uh, meet the public at the airport. Uh, she, uh, she definitely had the option of not doing that if she uh, preferred uh, to, uh, to uh, arrive in a, uh, in a way that had less profile. Uh, but my understanding is, uh, I wasn't there, but I, I understand from, uh, from my colleague that it was, it was her choice, uh, that is uh, the, uh, the young woman's choice, to immediately go into the public area of the airport uh, and uh, demonstrate that she was in fact in Canada uh, and that she was, uh, she was grateful for uh, this, this place of asylum that was prepared to uh, provide her that security. Okay, uh, while we wait for another question, it, could I just ask Mr. Minister Goodell, I'm curious about kind of Canada-U.S. relations in the context of, of... So are we. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Given what's going on in the United States, as we see in terms of their, their views, of, uh, at least the administration when it comes to immigration, tightening of borders, uh, I think much more sort of inward-looking than, than, than Canada, which is, which is a nation that has welcomed immigrants for, throughout its history. I'm, and the need for cooperation between nations when de dealing with international security issues. How is that U.S.-Canada relationship in the context of the current administration in terms of working together? Do they see us as a potentially somehow a weak link in the system because of the views that they're taking or the policies that they're implementing these days? I, I, I don't think so, Dale. Uh, I've had the opportunity to have many conversations about uh, related issues uh, of security in North America, migration and other issues, the border relationship. Uh, with uh, uh, Kirsten Nielsen, the, uh, the uh, um, current Secretary of Homeland Security, and her predecessor, uh, John Kelly, when he was in that role. Uh, there was a, a very open dialogue between my office and their office. Uh, conversations at the officials level uh, literally go back and forth across the border daily. Uh, the, uh, the lines of communication are, uh, are wide open. Uh, and. Um, uh, I have never seen any indication that there is a view uh, in Washington or in the national administration or in the American administration that uh, uh, that the northern border is uh, uh, is a problem. I, I see their northern border. I see uh, there are some members of the new Congress who are saying they would like to take a look at the northern border situation. Uh, largely because I think they see this vast number of American border officers being assigned to the Mexican border, uh, and they sort of wonder about the other end of the country. Uh, but uh, Congress did take a look at this two years ago. They conducted an official inquiry into the security of what they call the northern border, um, and uh, the, the report uh, came back uh, very favorable to Canada, uh, and at that time, uh, Secretary Kelly uh, commented very favorably about, uh, about the relationship with Canada, the security of the Canadian border, uh, and uh, 
he picked up on Canadian language that we would like to see that border thinned. Uh, thickening the border uh, begins to cause us problems. Uh, when you think about it though, that is the longest uh, non-militarized, most successful international boundary in the history of the world. Uh, there uh, are, are 400,000 people who go back and forth across that border every single day, 400,000 back and forth. Uh, there's two and a half billion dollars in trade that goes back and forth across that border every single day. Uh, obviously, uh, we want it to be smooth and efficient uh, for legitimate trade and travel, uh, but we want it to be secure so that if there are issues that need to be caught in terms of public safety, criminal activity, uh, uh, other types of, uh, of violations, uh, that that is all properly dealt with according to law. Uh, and it is. Uh, in dealing with the, uh, the irregular migration that happens across the, uh, uh, the border, the numbers have been steadily declining for most of this year, uh, most of last year and into the beginning of, uh, uh, of this year. Uh, but we can say with absolute confidence that every single Canadian law has been properly enforced at the border thanks to the good work of CBSA and the RCMP, uh, and uh, all of Canada's international obligations have been properly respected uh, as well. Um, and if the new Congress wants to take a, another look at the, uh, at the northern border, I'd be more than happy to uh, have them do it, uh, and I think they'll find a very favorable review of uh, how the border operates and the security relationship with Canada. Good, thanks. So we have a question here, I believe. Yes, I do, and then I have a question. Okay, well, let's give it to this gentleman, maybe, and then and the next one. Hello. Hello, Minister. Thank you, Honorable. Uh, thank you, Comrade uh, Mr. Godel. I'm a member of the party and the support of the riding. Uh, my name is Yus Candele. I'm a fruit of immigration. I will say thank you to all the taxpayers uh, for let me being here in Canada uh, as an immigrant refugee. Thank you very much. Honorable, uh, we're talking about safety and security. And uh, when I analyze my, uh, on my own perspective, safety and security of Canadians may be compromised through activities of some businesses uh, abroad, uh, businesses abroad or uh, operating internationally. I'm gonna illustrate the example of uh, the country where I'm coming from, the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's a huge reserve of mining industry in the world. And the Democratic Republic of Congo since 1996 have lost eight million of people through the war and through uh, the massive and tremendous uh, violence. Ministers, we've been seeing some of Canadian companies like Ivan Mine, LTD, like uh, Alpha Mine Resources Corps, are operating in the war torn zone where. Uh, millions of millions of Congolese are dying. How, my question is, my first question, how those companies are transfer the value of Canadian abroad? That's my first question. And my second question, uh, Minister, how do you make sure as a Minister of Safety of, uh, uh, of Safety how do we make sure that those Canadian companies are not participating in those illicit activities that uh, uh, allow millions of, of millions of Congolese dying in, in, uh, in, the, in the country? Thank you. Well, thank you for the question. It, uh, it goes uh, a fair bit beyond my uh, ministerial authority. Uh, for, uh, for public safety and, uh, and emergency preparedness. Um, uh, but I would think one of the principles that I talked about in terms of 
how we do public safety and security properly within Canada, I think that same principle would apply to the situation that you describe, and that's transparency. Uh, so that uh, uh, the, uh, the behavior of corporations uh, when they're operating in the international arena uh, is, not, uh, is not a secret or a mystery, uh, but uh, reported upon publicly. Uh, and uh, we have in the past uh, taken some steps in that direction. A good friend of mine uh, in, the, uh, in the Liberal Caucus, John McKay, introduced uh, a few years ago a private member's bill, uh, C-300, I believe it was, uh, to uh, uh, provide standards of uh, international corporate responsibility, uh, social responsibility, uh, and to provide a reporting system uh, with the appointment of, a, of an, a, a Canadian official, an ombudsman, that would monitor uh, uh, the behavior and, and report on it publicly. Um, it, it's the old principle of uh, le letting the sunshine in uh, so that, uh, that uh, uh, corporations will understand that Canadians expect them to function in the international community according to the same standards by which they function in Canada, uh, and that, uh, uh, that there will be a reporting mechanism to determine whether they do that or not. Um, and the, uh, the process of selecting that ombudsperson uh, is, uh, as I believe, is underway right now to, to put that official in place to provide that transparency and that, and that monitoring. Uh, as you say, that falls more in the jurisdiction of natural resources and foreign affairs, but, uh, but the transparency principle is one that is universally helpful. All right, so this question came through the live feed from Patrick Therian. Uh, Minister Goodale, thank you for your remarks. You mentioned several pressing issues, only some of which are addressed by Bills C-59 and C-76. What other legislative initiatives are on the horizon in the field of national security? Well, there are, uh, there are several. The, the, the largest bill is, uh, is C-59. That's the, uh, the comprehensive one that deals with uh, a number of the things I mentioned today and, and, uh, and several others. Um, an important bill is also C-21, um, which is, uh, it's called in the sort of the parliamentary language, the, the entry exit bill. Um, and that, that deals with the, the, the security of the, the Canada-US border. Uh, everyone knows that when you cross into Canada, whether you're a Canadian returning home or you're a new visitor coming to the country for the first time, you show your passport, you are identified, uh, and the border officials uh, go to some lengths to ensure that they know who you are and, and uh, the, the reason for your, your arrival in Canada. A lot of Canadians, I think, are surprised to know that the same sort of procedure does not apply when somebody leaves Canada. Uh, there is not the collection and recording of exit information. Entry information, yes, but exit information, no. Uh, and that leaves quite a hole in our, in our security framework. So we know when people come into the country, but not when they leave. Um, and it's important to, uh, to know both. So we undertook to fill that, that, that loophole. Uh, and uh, the bill, C-21, is now uh, uh, through the, uh, the parliamentary process. Uh, we're waiting for the regulations to be developed so that the bill could be, could be uh, uh, fully implemented. Um, but we've, we found a way to do this that does not impose any extra burden on the traveling public. Uh, so when somebody crosses that land border, if you're going into the United States, you show your passport to the American officials. If you're coming the other way, you show your passport to Canadian officials. But that will remain exactly the same, and the two countries will just flip the information back and forth uh, so that entry into one country is exit from the other country. Obviously, uh, that works uh, in the relationship between Canada and the United States. But we need the legal authority to collect that data, which we will do. Um, and, and C21 will give us the authority to uh, collect the data and also to do a better job on, uh, on uh, uh, combating uh, smuggling. Um, one issue, and I know we're running out of time here, but one issue that we're specifically dealing with by Bill C-21 and by Bill C-59 
uh, is the, the longstanding problem of false positives on the no-fly list. We've had a no-fly list in Canada since the uh, uh, early, oh, probably for uh, the last uh, 10 years. But it was designed in such a way that it was run by the airlines, not by the government. Uh, I presume the government of the day wanted to do it in the most inexpensive way possible. But that meant because the airlines were running it and not the government, you, you couldn't have an interactive system where somebody could, could correct a false positive. You just had to live with the false positive and fix it every time you wanted to board an airplane. Uh, well, we're now through C C-59 and C-21 correcting that problem uh, so that uh, uh, when there, when, if, if you have a name that, that coincides with the name that is on the no-fly list, but you yourself are an innocent person, once you have uh, identified that problem once, you'll be given uh, an automatic pre-clearance number, uh, like a PIN number, and you will enter that. Uh, when you go to get your next boarding pass and your, your false positive will automatically be cleared and you won't have this problem of having to go through a security clearance every time you want to board an aircraft. Uh, that's another correction that we're making in the security system. Um, and, you know, when you have a six-year-old kid who has the same name as some guy that's on the terrorist list, um, it's a bit of an embarrassment for that child every time they, they go to the airport that they're hauled off to get a security clearance. So we're fixing that one as well. There are a variety of others, but those are a couple of examples of, of the things we're moving on. We're just about out of time, and I wonder if I could just, oh, hi, would you? Okay, yeah. Uh, just wanted to know if um, you have policies in place to weed out people who seek Canadian citizenship through investment plans, but most of their money is through ill-gotten means. I mean, a lot of corrupt politicians from overseas, and when these people are indicted in their own country, they hide behind Canadian passport and they reach out to the Canadian consulates overseas and uh, ask them to bail them out. Uh, I mean, I would rather not have these people hide behind Canadian credentials and uh, something should be in place to screen these people and the money that they are using to get access to Canadian citizenship. You know, instances of that kind are uh, of great interest to the Department of Finance and to Revenue Canada. Uh, and uh, uh, there's an agency uh, that we created a number of years ago called FinTrack, uh, which is the, uh, um, the agency within Canada that tracks the illicit or, or illegal movement of funds uh, and tries to identify that. I mean, there are huge privacy issues that are involved here. Uh, but that is the agency that is charged with uh, national responsibility and international responsibility for tracking the illegal movement of money uh, through the Canadian banking system. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's a tough thing to, to follow, but most people will say if you're pursuing a, uh, a fraud or a Ponzi scheme or whatever else, follow the money. Uh, and you'll you'll eventually find the source of the problem, and that is FinTrack's responsibility. Maybe just one very quick last question, Minister Goodell. Then I think we'll have to run. But the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, I think, has been overall they, they like a lot of things that are in Bill C fifty nine, but they do make the argument that it has effectively watered down uh, the exemption for political dissidents and advocacy, and. In other words, that uh, the security apparatus now can actually act against people who are dissidents or, or you know, protesters or whatever. And they, 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 the quote that they use, they say, the words have been added, unless carried out, this is political advocacy or dissidents, uh, unless carried out in conjunction with an activity that undermines the security of Canada. So it's just kind of this, this broad uh, statement that can be applied as their argument. Uh, do you have any kind of particular response to that? Well, actually, the, the problem that they're referring to arose under the previous legislation, uh, which we can get into a, an argument here about the numbers, but was C-51, uh, which was the very controversial piece of legislation um, under, the, uh, under the previous government before the last election. C-59 uh, attempts to correct those problems. 
Uh, so there are several places in C59 where we've taken steps to protect the right to, to uh, dissent, to protest, to advocate, uh, to make sure that that activity is not, is not deemed in any way to be, uh, to be uh, subversive or, uh, or, or subject to complaint or criticism. Uh, I suppose in this era, some of this will always be a judgment call. But that's, again, why the transparency measures are so important. Uh, if, if there were a set of issues where, where potentially uh, this, this power could be, could be abused, it would be a perfect subject for examination by the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians. So we have three new levels of review. The Committee of Parliamentarians, the Intelligence Commissioner, and the National Security and Intelligence Review Agency, all of them can go after that kind of an issue and make sure that the authority of the security agencies is not impinging upon the legitimate rights of Canadians to protest. Good. Well, listen, uh, tremendous uh, insight into what's a, a great scope of, of issues and complex issues and challenging ones. And uh, we really do appreciate you taking the time to talk about uh, these initiatives, and uh, I'd like to ask everybody to join with me and to thank Mr. Goodell for being here today. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, everyone.